The bushfire emergency is thankfully over. Here at the RFS headquarters, things are a lot more quiet than they have been over the past summer. At ABC News, we're staying in touch with those communities that are bouncing back after an extraordinary succession of disasters. In the first of a series of special reports, we take you to Conjola Park, just outside Lake Conjola on the south coast, where locals are facing a massive task of rebuilding after 89 homes were destroyed. Conjola Park should be bustling with holidaymakers. Instead, the streets are empty, the forest is bare, and it's eerily quiet. Little debris has been cleared. That means when Kim Harper returns to her street, she relives the day her town was ravaged. Everything's gone, like house after house after house. And it makes me cry, still a month later. Kim's home survived, but was damaged and is unlivable. Locals are frustrated the cleanup hasn't begun. There's a lot of people that are still living out here and they don't have any option but to live here. Their house wasn't destroyed and it must kill them every day when they wake, open their eyes and they wake up and they see what they're living amongst. It's like a disaster has hit Lake Ajola. Alicia Stoneham was one of those who lost everything. She took this video before her partner and their dog hid in a dam as a firestorm swallowed their possessions. I'm suffering from the flames coming up over the back and over the other side of the road. Uh, you know, you don't let go of that emotion. You're still going to have it. It's still living with you. And, like some people here, the couple was uninsured. They've received $1,000 from the state government but have nowhere to live. We're going to clean up and pretty much try to see if we could stay here or look for elsewhere accommodation. There are asbestos warnings in every street, but residents haven't been told when it will be removed or when they can start rebuilding their homes. Contractors are still working out how to clear the debris. There are families who are still waiting on insurance payments and others who are too traumatised to return at all. And you can see why. There is still devastation everywhere you look. Residents are clearing what they can. Most of it I thought would be fire impacted stuff, but now it's hazard reduction. Everyone's just that scared that it's going to come back. But it costs them $28 per load. You try and do the right thing and you get sort of, you know, stumped by bureaucracy. And on hot days, bad memories come racing back. There is still a lot of fuel and personally I don't think it would take much to, to start up again. A small recovery team is moving the town forward, offering food, support and a link to crucial government services. Some people are very stoic, but then it might be something very small, either a bad thing or a good thing, a happy thing, that will make them break down and cry. Donated furniture is being used to rebuild homes from the inside out. The early signs of progress for a community hoping to thrive once more. Selby Stewart, ABC News, Conjola Park. The scale of this disaster became evident when the army was called in to help and they'll be on the job for months, as Ashley Raper reports. It's huge, we've got the north of the state that's been waiting three or four months for recovery and here down in the south they are eager for recovery but we've still got active fire so it's, it's a balancing game. John Barillaro is the person in the New South Wales government tasked with cleaning up a devastated state. Which one are we going? The Deputy Premier is today with Andrew Constance, whose electorate of Bega bore the brunt of the New Year's Eve bushfires. On hand, the Australian Defence Force. Behind the scenes, the ADF's doing a huge amount of work, dropping water out to a farm so people have drinking water through to obviously clearing valuable and important roads. The ADF has been here for almost a month. This isn't simply cleaning up a tree on a road, it's clearing a path to the area's damaged Telstra Tower. And it's being done by reservists. I work as a disability support uh, worker. Yeah, talking to the community or looking after people, that's, that's kind of my day job at the moment. Um, but yeah, now we've been called up and we're ready to do as much as we can. They've been travelling the area in Bushmasters, usually used in combat. The 6,000 regular army and reservists 
have cleared almost 2,000 kilometres of road, removed 2,500 trees and delivered more than 14,000 meals. They've also helped with another special delivery. The lady had gone into labour on a station that was somewhat isolated. We were able to chop open her driveway. There'd been a number of fallen trees that were blocking uh, access to her driveway and she delivered uh, two minutes after arrival at the hospital. In that case, the ADF has brought joy. For others, it's security and muscle. A lot of people have left town to go away and recover somewhere else and I think when they come back they'd like to see it without having 50 hours or 200 hours of chainsaw work. But there's a task beyond their brief, clearing blocks where houses have been lost. The worst thing is when, when you go to your place and there's just rubble. The clearing of that rubble will be done by contractors, with the government picking up the tab. Just in this small area, the scale of the cleanup is simply overwhelming. At the moment, the time frame is six months to have everything cleared, then the rebuild begins. And that is an ambitious target, uh, six months for us, and, and it is difficult. But for individuals, it's, it's going to be tough. Too long to wait for Yuha Tutanen, who wants to rebuild on his property of 36 years. I'm going to try to look for private contractors now because I'm not going to wait six months. Are you optimistic about your future here? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Only forward. One of the worst hit areas was Bilpin in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney and many businesses there are saying it could take years before they fully recover. The hills around Bilpin are scarred by a summer lost to fires. Outside Lionel Bucket's luxury cabins, what was once a picturesque view, now a stark reminder of what he endured. It was a bit like Armageddon coming. It was a huge fire storm. On December the 15th, flames came roaring through his property. This is the dream cabin. Remarkably, all his cabins were saved, but they've largely stood empty with very few bookings since the fires. Usually this is peak period, usually we're booked all year round. So it, it's, a big, it's a big hit, so the cash flow's gone. A loss to his business means others like tour operator Jock and Spencer are suffering too. We'd estimate probably um, a third of our customers that go on the Glowworm tours are actually guests staying in the cabins. So you can imagine suddenly if there's no guests, that's, that's a huge chunk of customers that we're not getting anymore. It's not going to be easy to make something out of them. Down the road, self-employed builder John Knowles is also hurting financially. He lost around $25,000 worth of tools when his shed went up in flames. Generally, I've uh, been caused to be a bit unemployable by the burning of my tools. So far, he's received little financial assistance, and this week, John and a group of Bilpin business owners went to Canberra, calling on the government to do more to help. It would be really useful right now if I could replace the critical tools that I've lost, because then I could get back earning money and start functioning as a normal member of society again. Fortunately, some have received government grants like fruit grower Sean Lonergan. It's helped begin the recovery process on his 25-acre orchard. Just got to clean up, replace all the irrigation. There's plenty of work to do, but there won't be any income. Many of these apple trees are so badly damaged they'll have to be replanted and it could take several years before this orchard again bears fruit and the business is thriving. Despite the loss, Sean is determined to focus on the positives. I heard there was a live bird running around there yesterday and I've actually taken, there's a water dragons on the dam out back there and it's just amazing how those sort of animals have survived. A community staying optimistic as they work to rebuild and recover. Lydia Feng, ABC News, Bilpin. Meanwhile, nature is slowly recovering. In the northern Blue Mountains, green shoots are popping up among the burnt out bush and forests. All around the Mount Toma Botanic Gardens, black stumps are sprouting new shoots. See, this area was really intensely burnt. But... Greg Burke is the curator who defended his own home during this megafire. The flames in my street were 70 metres high, so more than twice the height of the, the trees, and that is something I've never seen before. 
He also helped protect the 6,000 or so ornamental species here. Well, as you can see from these plants, the fire got inside the fence. Um, but we've been really fortunate that some of our large trees like this coastal redwood from California have survived unscathed. And he says the garden's native bushland is already slowly rebounding. Now, what are we looking at here? What's the orange stuff? The orange stuff is, is one of those slime moulds that's fire dependent. So after the fire comes through, these take off really rapidly. It breaks down the nutrients and the seed from the eucalypts uh, and all these seedlings germinate and take off. But there are limits to the recovery. Brett Summerall leads a scientific team that defends wild ecosystems from exotic weeds and diseases. More frequent, more intense fires makes it much more difficult for these types of, types of ecosystem to recover from things like drought. So we do need to do everything that we can to, to protect them and restore them. And you are seeing our famous Wallamai pine. It's a, a weird tree. International weird tourists are also returning. We've seen some of the devastation, um, but we're also seeing some of the rebirth. It's amazing how some of these trees are able to bounce back. Fresh regrowth is also encouraging locals. For all of us that live up here, you can get quite flattened by seeing the black every day, but equally seeing the green is something we're all looking out for now. Tessa McLaughlin nearly lost her family's cider shed. She's been overwhelmed by the generosity of tourists. There are areas that have been burnt, but there are also areas that haven't been burnt. So you can still go on a bushwalk and see the same beautiful scenery that you want to see. There are fantastic restaurants that, that look the same as they do normally. A lot of the bed and breakfasts are doing special rates at the moment. So it's a really fantastic time to not only see the Blue Mountains, probably get a few bargains, but also support the communities as well. The town of Kaya on the far south coast of New South Wales had a terrifying start to the new year when the blaze known as the Border Fire destroyed half the town's homes. One couple saved their historic house with the help of a homemade fire bunker. When bushfire engulfed Kaya, Mick Harewood and Sue Norman's 1890s cottage seemed unlikely to withstand the blaze. No one believed that this house could survive fire. It's in right in amongst the forest. The forest has actually grown up around it since it was built. For Mick, being at the property to defend the house was crucial and only possible because of a fire bunker the couple built years earlier. If I didn't have a bunker, I would have had to leave. To, you know, we, I wouldn't have been game to stay here. A poorly constructed bunker can be lethal. So Mick and Sue spent years researching how to build theirs. It's equipped with compressed air, and is impenetrable to gases. Carbon dioxide levels and air pressure can also be monitored. This small ceramic glass window was a big investment, but it was Mick Harewood's only connection to the outside world as fire roared over the property. That's just outside the window here, 10 metres away. The house survived, but Sue's studio, with a lifetime's worth of artworks, mm. books and research, was destroyed and their forest home has been left deeply scarred. It's not just here, it's the landscape all around us has changed forever. A disaster that's left an indelible impact on this quiet and treasured part of New South Wales. Vanessa Milton, ABC News, Kaya. In the historic southern town of Cabargo, three people lost their lives in the New Year's Eve bushfires. But the area is slowly recovering, as Juanita Phillips found out. Six weeks after bushfires left this landscape a blackened wasteland, nature is regenerating. The villagers too are coming back to life, tourists are returning and the rebuilding business is booming. There's hope and music in the air. Let me take you by the hand. And everyone has a story to tell. In the middle of the day, it was night time. It was the smoke was so much. Very scary. All the town's on fire and it was just, all the flames were going over my place and, and uh, people were driving past yelling out, get out, go! But like the landscape, the people too are carrying deep scars. Hi David, hi Kyle. Hi there. How are you going? Very well, thank you. How's business? Good. Oh, excellent. Yeah. David Wilson and Kyle Moser lost their home in the fire, but the post office they run was saved. In a small town, the post office that does banking and lotto 
is as critical as the pub. I think five weeks in, it's um, if your adrenaline's going down, everybody's feeling a lot more emotional, a little bit more angry about things. The Prime Minister got a, a, a kind of a difficult response when he arrived here for the first time. Yeah. Do you think people are still angry about the federal government? Well, I think some people are angry that he got a serve like that. They wanted his assistance. Um, other people think it's wonderful because I personally believe it spurred the government into action. The local co-op is going gangbusters selling building supplies, but many customers also come here just to talk. Some want a hug, some don't. Some people... It goes like this for people. I've had my days where it's been a reverse in the car park. You know, I'm out there hugging people, asking them about their day and supporting them through whatever they're going through. And I've had the days too where people said, how are you going, Dan? I've gone, oh, today I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not coping. It's going to be years before we start to feel like we're just back to normal. Shane Black and Sue Wilson fought for nine hours to save their home. Next door, two of their neighbours died while defending theirs. Even I, as a local, couldn't get my head around just how widespread it came through. The front was just absolutely mind-boggling. They lost a hundred head of prime beef cattle carbonised by the firestorm. Getting replacement cattle now is going to be the hard one because no one's got any. They say the fire has brought everyone in the community closer. I'm not a huggy person, everyone knows that, <laughs> but everyone was hugging everybody else. They knew that we were in a desperate situation and they all pulled together. I'm very proud, I am very proud of the people in this town. The state's mid-north coast was forced to grapple with bushfires as far back as winter and spring. One little known story from the northern rivers involves a community called Pretty Gully and the avocado farmer Colin Foister. It's a heart-wrenching day for Colin Foister and his family business. Just three months ago, each of these charred trees was full of promise, bearing fruit worth $4,000 come harvest. Completely and utterly dead. They're 20 years old, so there's a lot of work in them. Even before fire ripped through this farm in October, it had already been a tough year. First came the drought, then a massive hailstorm hit the property in March. After surviving the drought and getting the trees through with a really good crop, we got the whole orchard basically wiped out. Then came the fires. From when we first saw the flames to when it was touching the orchard was a matter of two or three seconds. They were 60 to 80 metres tall, these flames. That came up this mountain. The Bangara Creek fire started in remote bushland near the upper reaches of the Clarence River. There's only one road in and out and it was soon cut off. We knew that we could escape into the orchard. We had irrigation running at the time. But his plan came undone when the irrigation hoses were burned, forcing his team of 10 workers to put out spot fires manually. For the next 30 hours all we did was just fight fires in the orchard. Four of the crew were from Papua New Guinea, working in Australia on short-term farm visas. They'd never fought a bushfire. They pushed themselves physically until they had nothing left. Recovery will be slow and involves replanting lost trees and preparing for the next drought with more dams. But there is rebirth in the forest and in the orchard thanks to recent rain. The latest hurdle has been young fruit dropping from his still drought-stressed trees. You have to be positive. It's, it's not a job for a pessimist. He's now firmly focused on his next harvest. Catherine Marchignac, ABC News, Pretty Gully. The state's animal population has been devastated by these fires and there's perhaps no creature more emblematic of the crisis and recovery than the koala. So I paid a visit to the Port Macquarie Koala Hospital to see how some of their furry patients are going. It's a must-do destination for koala lovers, but this summer Port Macquarie's koala hospital has been hectic. This is um, Zanani. She was a joey and got really badly burnt. The state's koalas and their bushland habitats are now under immense pressure. A growing challenge for Shane Flanagan, the centre's clinical director. You must have been completely overwhelmed after the fires. Oh, yeah, when, when there was just like a conveyor belt. 
and we still had our normal patients coming in. We still had hit by cars, attacked by dogs and disease, as well as treating all the burnt ones. It was just wall to wall koalas. How badly burnt were they? Um, some were really badly burnt and they of course were put to sleep. What do you think the state is of koalas in the wild right now? In New South Wales and Queensland, the state of koalas is grim. It's the only way to describe it. Not good at all. How bad? Bad. Probably an 80% decline. The koala carer has become a wildlife campaigner. She'll speak at the United Nations this week about the race to save koalas from a changing climate, land clearing and deadly diseases. You're going to the UN, you're making a pitch to them, what do you want to say? Um, well they want to ask us about the fires and what it's done to wildlife and our pitch to them is we really need their support, we need them to put pressure on our government and we need lots of money to buy as much land as we possibly can. But we've got to address the other issues or it's not going to happen and those issues are our uh, carbon emissions because if, if the temperatures continue to rise and the conditions get drier it's not going to be good out there for wildlife at all. Before we go, a reminder that our coverage of this disaster continues. The ABC has launched a specialist bushfire recovery team with dedicated reporters to ensure that communities affected continue to have a voice. To all those who've led us into your neighbourhoods, especially in difficult circumstances, to share your stories, thank you. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Thanks for watching.